Good afternoon, I'm David Wessel, uh, director of the Hutchins Center at Brookings and one of the co-sponsors of the Municipal Finance Conference. I'm very pleased today that we have a terrific panel to talk about Puerto Rico's bankruptcy, lessons learned both for Puerto Rico and for the entire muni market. I'm gonna turn the virtual podium over to Michelle Kasky from Bloomberg, our very capable moderator. She's been an excellent chronicler of Puerto Rico's travails and she will introduce the panel and take it from there. So over to you. Hi, thanks, David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we'll be talking about Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico's bankruptcy. We have Natalie Juresco, who is the former executive director of Puerto Rico's Financial Oversight and Management Board. We also have Sergio Marswash. He is the policy director at the Center for a New Economy. And David Skeel, he is chairman of Puerto Rico's Financial Oversight and Management Board. He also teaches law at University of Pennsylvania's Law School. And then also we have, and finally, uh, John Cefalio. He is an analyst at uh, Credit Sites. He's a senior muni credit analyst at Credit Sites who's been uh, following Puerto Rico for quite some time. So we're happy to have everybody here. Um, we're looking forward to this conversation. And I just wanted to start off by saying, just on background, as as many people know, um, Puerto Rico um, for years was suffering from um, economic contraction, economic decline, population loss. And during those years, um, through different administrations, um, the governments then um, were borrowing money to basically keep the government operating. And that could that could last only for so long. And um, during that time, they there was this municipal bond market that was very, very willing to continue to lend to Puerto Rico. Um, but again, that it, it, it got to a point where the market just wasn't going to continue to lend to Puerto Rico at rates that Puerto Rico could accept. And this all really came to a head. Um, and Puerto Rico, um, at the time of the bankruptcy filing, uh, Puerto Rico and its agencies owed about, uh, owed more than 70 billion of debt and also had a pension fund that was essentially pretty much empty. And um, and Puerto Rico's, uh, the, the Financial Oversight Board sought bankruptcy on Puerto Rico's behalf in May of 2017. So since then about half the debt has been restructured. Um, there are more workouts to come, um, most notably Puerto Rico's Electric Power Authority. Um, but basically we wanted to get into, um, I wanted to ask the panelists, you know, Puerto Rico restructured its general obligation debt in March. Um, that effectively ended its five-year bankruptcy for the, the central government. And um, so that restructured about 19 billion of debt and started funding its pension, its pension fund. So I wanted to ask, and, um, Maybe if David Skeel wants to jump in or, or Natalie, um, sort of with Puerto Rico's bankruptcy, you know, what worked, what didn't work, and, and what are some of potentially the implications for uh, the rest of the muni market? Sort of what lessons can be learned as of now from Puerto Rico's bankruptcy? So I'd like to say in, in response to what worked, what didn't work, uh, <laughs> everything worked um, uh, in the end. I don't know that that would be exactly an accurate um, statement. It did take five years and there were uh, lots of ups and downs that were uh, exacerbated by the, uh, the hurricanes, the, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, the uh, the ousting of a governor um, and the, um, the pandemic. Um, so it did take a, a, a long time, but it it really did work um, overall, in, in my view. Uh, we ended up where our objective when we started was our mantra was once and done, um, that we couldn't do this, that Puerto Rico can't do this multiple times. They have one crack at bankruptcy, they're not going to have another crack, so you can't just do a hope and a prayer where you restructure the debt a little bit and hope that on uh, five or 10 years, the economy is doing well enough to 
to uh, carry this heavy burden. Uh, we believed it needed to be once and done. And mm -hmm. what that meant was uh, we were very, very careful about how much debt there would be going forward. There's a maximum of $1.15 billion in any given year, which is less than 8% of Puerto Rico's own revenues, the revenues that come um, from Puerto Rico to make something that made sense for the creditors and was fair to them and consistent with the rule of law. We also added a significant amount of, of, of uh, cash um, and created a, a contingent value instrument, an instrument that if Puerto Rico's economy does well in the future years, we'll pay more to creditors. If it doesn't do um, well in future years, it will pay less to creditors. And we can maybe get into some of the details of this if, if folks want um, later on. But it was a very long process. It took longer than we would have liked. I would say that's the main um, downside, but the the restructuring we ended up with, I'm just I cannot overstate how happy I am with it. And as I see Natalie, I have to do a shout out to Natalie. Natalie was the point person um, throughout um, this process. Um, a, a really great result for everybody, in in my view. Clearly sustainable for Puerto Rico going forward. Clearly fair to the creditors. Um, the the general obligation bondholders in particular will end up doing pretty well in the end. So really, really a good result in my view. Yeah, and Sergio, what, you wanted to say something? Well, yeah, I mean, I generally agree with David, but I, I will do my analysis of, of PROMESA a little bit different. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think the law um, as enacted by Congress um, basically uh, concentrated on three different items. And, and he mentioned one of them, which was the debt, you know, debt relief and debt restructuring, which is very important. Um, and Title III did produce a, a plan of adjustment uh, that provides significant debt relief to Puerto Rico. Um, remains a question how you measure that, but, but in general, I, I agree that it, it, it succeeded in, in getting something, some debt relief to Puerto Rico. Uh, the second part of PROMESA was though uh, on reforming the budget process. And mm -hmm. there I think progress has been a bit slower uh, due to the fact that there has been a lot of, you know, give and take between uh, the board and, and the local government, which I think was foreseeable since the beginning. And I remember talking to people at Treasury saying this, this is not going to be that easy. You know, politicians are just not gonna give up this power uh, to uh, to allocate the budget, especially because Puerto Rico, in many ways, it's still pretty much a patron client society, uh, organized around extracting re I mean uh, rents from from the government, and the politicians are loath to to give those powers. And then there there was a third component, uh, a very small component, but that was uh, very important, and it was a big selling point for the Obama administration, which had to do with Title V and you know strategic projects to to get the economy going, and for several reasons that that didn't quite work out. So uh, I think in in general, though, when when you analyze uh, Promesa as a whole, not only the Title III component, you know some things worked, some things have work partially and we're still dealing with the budget process especially you know getting puerto rico uh to to implement the internal controls and and the budget visibility process that it needs to going forward and the economic growth and strategic process uh strategic projects part generally fell down by the wayside mostly due to the hurricane to be honest uh but uh, I just wanted to to give a little more context as to how I see uh, the entire PROMESA process go, uh, working. Yeah, I think you're right, Sergio. It's definitely the PROMESA's, what, what it did is, you know, giving Puerto Rico the ability to actually reduce its debt and fix the pension fund. Um, that, that seems, I mean, that has really moved things along and helped Puerto Rico to uh, to get on a new path, but it, it does remain to be seen whether the local government will um, live within its means. Um, and and Natalie, Natalie's got something to say here. Mm -hmm. I just think that you really can't take the pieces apart that way. Mm -hmm. I think that the debt restructuring and the reduction of the debt payable 
and the resolution of the pension problems, the adoption of the plan of adjustment on the basis of a fiscal plan, which provides for a vision of how to see forward through this, is the baseline for being able to manage a balanced budget because we've reduced the stress on that budget so dramatically that now other choices get to be made. Mm -hmm. And it provides the baseline for economic development because you theoretically have a government that's more credible in the marketplace. You have a market with a resolved debt structure that should reduce capital costs across the board. Now, there are many other things that you know, governments need to do to be uh, attractive to, for, to, 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 to investment. There are many other things that governments need to do in order to resolve all the social problems that unfortunately remain in many societies. But without the debt restructuring, none of those things are possible. And so it's kind of a chicken and egg in some way, but I think the debt restructuring is the baseline. Now, now you need political will on the part of the elected leadership to do what elected leaders need to do and what their, what their constituents uh, drive. But I think that PROMESA was never supposed to be, was not seen as a control board, and we didn't play that role as a control board. As an oversight board, I think we accomplished a great deal, and I think we put Puerto Rico on a path where if its elected leadership and the constituents demand that of their elected leadership can accomplish both, again, resolving social ills uh, with the government spending, as well as attracting and develop and economic development, attracting investment and economic development. I don't, I don't think that, you know, pieces failed. I think that they were never meant to be, uh, it was never meant to be a control board, which would have had the ability to enforce in that, in the way that Washington DC, for example, did. That's, that's true, but I think then part of the problem then is um, down the road, how, what is going to, what is going to force the local government to um, live within its means and, and to implement these, these structural reforms? I mean, at some point it will, it, it will um, fall back onto them. And I, I think that's, that's the uncertainty going forward. Um, As it is in any municipal environment, right? I mean, if you look at Detroit, you know, you have to have a government that serves the interests of its constituents. If you look at cities that are undergoing financial challenges or, you know, whether it's Chicago or the state of Illinois, you know, it, it's the same demands being made of elected leadership everywhere. Are mm -hmm. you serving the people? Are you using your resources wisely to reduce social ills and to attract investment and grow your economy? You know, why are we expecting that somehow the oversight board was supposed to be a magic solution for Puerto Rico? It, it, it provided the baseline for Puerto Rico, but, you know, elected leaders to need to take responsibility as well. Mm -hmm. I do think that going forward, though, and I, I know that the plan of adjustment uh, has some, you know, the limits and uh, other fiscal rules incorporated into it, but eventually the plan of adjustment will will end, right? I mean, it, it has some termination date. Uh, I do think there's a need to legislate new Puerto Rico safeguards uh, in terms of uh, fiscal rules, um, limits on deficit spending and, and debt issuance. We already have some of those even in, in our constitution and they obviously did not work or uh, or at least they were relatively easy to work around, let's put it that way. Uh, and, and we do have to do that, that work going forward uh, in terms of uh, what are the, the modern fiscal rules that make sense for Puerto Rico, what kind of safeguards uh, can we have going forward? And we have been doing some thinking about that. There's a lot of work that, as Natalie know, that has been done on many other jurisdictions about this. And, and that certainly, uh, pending uh, on Puerto Rico's side uh, to work on that, perhaps even amending the constitution uh, to, to have some, some real fiscal rules that, that make sense. And even, even the, the, the fiscal plans, they do warn that Puerto Rico will face future budget deficits if certain structural reforms aren't put into place. Um, and, and part of that has to do with that, <clears throat> even with the debt restructuring, um, some of these fixed costs, like uh, future debt service, which, as as David Skeel pointed out, has dropped dramatically. But if you if you add that along with the the pension payments, 
that Puerto Rico needs to make every year. It still is taking up a, a, a sizable amount of the yearly budget, and that that's the reality. Um, but again, it's it balance, future balanced budgets will really depend on the, some of these structural reforms. Again, you know, future balanced budgets require growth. Mm. And you need to grow the economy. You need to have a model of economic growth. You can't do it all through the expenditure side. You can't, you can't balance budgets solely by reducing expenditures constantly, whether it's debt, pensions, or you know, other, other expenditures, education, police. It's just not, there's a limit to the, the reduction of expenditures. At some point, you have to see a model. And that's what those structural reforms are about. How do we get growth? How do we see a Puerto Rico that's competitive and attracting investment? To date, Puerto Rico's economic model has been based on federal funding, federal tax relief, and or Puerto Rico tax relief. Mm -hmm. How do you get out of that model and move to a model that's not based on offering tax reductions when you need those taxes to, 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 to invest in your social um, you know, policy? How do, you, how do you have a different economic growth model? And that's why those structural reforms focused on you know, the competitiveness of the you know, regulatory environment in Puerto Rico, permitting, uh, re property registration, the, con the competitiveness of the labor market in Puerto Rico. How do we make it so that people believe that Puerto Rico is the best place to put their IT business? Um, mm -hmm. How do we build an, a cadre of workers that attracts uh, investors. So that's why those structural reforms are there because over time you've got to grow. And to grow to grow, you're going to need different policies in place than what are there today. I, but, I agree with the, with the part that we need to grow the economy, but but I think we have to go one step back, uh, Natalie. Uh, some of the policies that you mentioned may, may be very useful, but but I don't think they constitute really a growth strategy. I mean, and that's the exercise that Puerto Rico needs to do. I mean, what's what's what? Where are we? Uh, where where do we have a comparative advantage relative to to the region, relative to to the mainland? Um, where are the the places where we should be making our bets in terms of uh, economic development. We really haven't done that analysis. Uh, I do know that Manolo Cidre and the people at the Department of Economic Development are have put out something out there. I'm not really convinced that what they, they have put out, it's really a strategy in the sense where you can actually uh, identify uh, sectors where Puerto Rico has a comparative advantage and, and you know, focus on those, on those sectors and then measure you know, whether or not they're delivering in terms of income, in terms of employment, in terms of uh, generating economic activity, uh, and then you know, reassess whether or not the whole plan uh, is working. There are many examples around the world, not only uh, in Europe, uh, also in the Caribbean, mainland. Uh, a lot of jurisdictions have done this. Uh, we in Puerto Rico did it uh, back in the 1950s when we, were, we had less resources available. So it's not impossible. Uh, but, but I think uh, that's the step that, that we're truly missing right now uh, in terms of like doing that uh, economic strategy, industrial policy, choose your name uh, for the island. And I, I don't disagree with Sergio at all. I would just uh, say that those sorts of things, in my view, are not the primary responsibility of the board. Our, our most important <laughs> responsibility, and, and you're, I'm, you're not saying otherwise. Um, yeah. I just want to clarify that for, uh, for folks who might not instantly pick up on that. Um, our, our primary role, in my view, in this area is to create the conditions for growth, to, to make sure the balance or bu budgets are balanced, try to put in place a framework that will make that true, not just now, but but for a while to come. And, and we have created a runway that's gonna be very helpful in that regard. So we have in the plan of adjustment limits on the issuing uh, mm -hmm. issuance of debt for the next few years. Sergio alluded to those as well. We also require that massive amounts of money be put aside to make sure that we can make those pension payments that Michelle alluded to, that uh, $175 million a year minimum, up to 25% of, of the surplus, or I think it may even be 50% of the surplus, um, 
which is likely to, to end up being about $10 billion set aside to make sure that even if things do turn down in the future, those pensions will, will be paid. So there is a runway that has been created and the board does have some role in, in development. There are, there are some things we can do. Um, uh, title um, five is, is a piece of that. There's some other things we can do, but, but really that's Puerto Rico and, and its lawmakers will be putting the plans in place. Yeah, and um, definitely there's the question too of what's what's forward for Puerto Rico uh, once this, uh, all this federal money um, dries up. Uh, there's been a lot of FEMA money that's come to the island and uh, there's the COVID relief money. And John, I know you and I, we, we've talked about this, is the issue of what, what happens after all that federal money um, runs out. Yeah, I think, yeah. Michelle, thank you. Um, I, I think that's a cause for a lot of skepticism in the muni market, just as you look back in, in Puerto Rican history, um, it seems that at times when Puerto Rico, it seems that when Puerto Rico was prospering and growing, it was often because of investments from, from Washington, be they uh, military investments down there that, that helped the economy or uh, tax breaks down there that helped. And now um, money from the hurricane relief and, and rebuilding and also stimulus. Um, and if you look at the underlying Puerto Rico economy and, and the, the foundations of it, 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 it seems very weak without that. And I think I'd, I'd particularly call attention to the demographics in Puerto Rico. And, and Puerto Rico lost um, almost 13% of its population during the last decade, which is just a staggering number. And, and you almost, you really can't find any jurisdiction in the world that hasn't had a war or a famine or something that lost anywhere near that amount. I mean, people made a big deal um, in the 2020 census when Illinois lost population and they lost less than 1% of, of population. So uh, Puerto Rico's loss is staggering. And when you look at the young por uh, population in, um, in Puerto Rico, um, that Puerto Rico now or 2020 census had half of the population of 14 and under that it did in 2000. So that's the, that's the labor force for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, that, that's that small. And um, so who's gonna be on the island? Who's gonna work? Where's the labor force coming from that's gonna attract employers? So I think there's a lot of concern that as the stimulus wears off, which had an outsized importance in Puerto Rico, and as the uh, hurricane rebuilding and, and reconstruction um, wears down, what's left in the economy. And so that's really up to up to Puerto Rico is if they can take that money and build a better infrastructure with it and a better water and sewer system, better highway system, better power system, um, then that could help build a foundation for future growth. But if, if that money is, is squandered or not used efficiently, um, not used to, for future growth, then um, we have real concerns 10 years out about, about Puerto Rico servicing its debt because of the economy. And what are some of the, the industries that, um, that Puerto Rico could look towards um, to really help grow the economy? I know um, tourism, the governments, the different administrations, they always talk about growing the, the tourism business. I think a lot of people are surprised to learn that even today, tourism is, is still less than 10% of, um, of Puerto Rico's overall economy. I was like shocked to hear that a number of years ago because everyone thinks it's like just the main thing that's driving the island. But, um, but John and Sergio, what, what are just some of the, the options that Puerto Rico has? Well, we, we, we still have a significant footprint uh, in pharma and, uh, you know, biotech, which, you know, has, has you know, decreased uh, over the years. But we, we do have uh, a certain infrastructure there that we can leverage. Also, there, there are several opportunities that I think we're not taking uh, into account. You know, everything from like, you know, certain agricultural products so where you know they're high value added uh, low volume you know like herbs and spices 
uh, to uh, things like um, healthcare. And by healthcare, I mean, um, uh, you know, doing uh, R&D on specific illnesses, for example, that affect Hispanic populations. You know, we, we may have uh, an advantage there. Uh, we also have some great opportunities in green energy. You know, uh, Secretary uh, Yellen is, is talking about uh, onshoring or uh, French shoring, I, I guess is the word she's using, uh, some of the stuff we buy from China now. Again, there are opportunities there. Uh, the big difference now uh, uh, when relative to the 1950s is that in the 1950s, we were basically the only player in the region. We're not the only player in the region anymore, right? We have competition from Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic, other countries that have signed, uh, you know, bilateral trade agreements with the United States. Uh, so we we really have to, uh, you know, put uh, put a lot of work into this and a lot of thought into how we can do it. But but the opportunities are there, in my opinion. I think it's. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, I think it's, I, I generally agree with Sergio. It's a little bit of everything, a little bit of agriculture, a little bit of tourism, a little bit of high tech manufacturing. And, and, but I, a lot of the manufacturing is always required federal tax incentives, which is, is worrisome. And then the other worrisome thing about manufacturing and having too many eggs in that basket is as time goes by, manufacturing tends to get more and more efficient and you need fewer, fewer employees to do the same thing. So it's not always, you know, the best thing for a local economy. I grew up in um, in Northwest Indiana and there used to be steel mills that employed 50,000 people and they still make steel there. They make a lot of steel there, but now it's, you know, a hundred people with master's degrees that are, that are doing it. And so those towns that used to have all those working class employees that were paying taxes and, and, and living in the homes there and going to school aren't really there in the, in the same way. And so that's a tough thing about having a lot of eggs in the manufacturing basket. You know, I, I, and I, I agree with that completely. That's why I advocate more of a portfolio approach. I, I think traditionally, uh, you're right. Traditionally, Puerto Rico has done that. You know, we have put too much weight uh, on that sector. Uh, but I wouldn't disregard it completely though, going forward. We do still have some, some opportunities there. That's, that's all I'm saying. Mm. I agree. I'd like to get back to, um, the bankruptcy itself again and sort of get in some of the into some of those details and definitely one thing that, that i was struck by um with puerto rico's bankruptcy is it seems like it's starting or not starting but it's continuing this trend of uh pensioners um faring better through the process than than bondholders and and other creditors and um so in puerto rico there were uh, no cuts to to pensions um to pension payments and the bankruptcy itself actually like as we said before uh ensured that uh puerto rico would once again start um investing in its pension fund um so it can support its retirees a similar thing happened in in detroit uh if i remember correctly in detroit pensioners actually took a little bit of a haircut but it was um might have been around 10 percent or just less than 10 percent which was uh, a lot less than than the haircuts that the bondholders took so it seems like it's um continuing this trend where the the retirees the public workers uh are going to uh, do better than than the bondholders and i'm wondering what you guys think about that um do you see that continuing in the muni market I'm going to speak and say that I, I think this that Puerto Rico is somewhat unique, and I think comparing it to Detroit and others may disagree and to other munis is, is not necessarily a fair comparison. A couple things. One, prior to the bankruptcy, not in the plan of adjustment, Puerto Rican public pensioners took a variety of cuts um, over the periods of the lead up to the crisis. And so if you only measure it as what's in the plan, you're correct. There were no cuts in the plan. However, there were a series of cuts prior to that. Second, I would argue that if you look at the average pensions of public pensions in Puerto Rico, they are substantially lower than in many other municipalities in the United States. And so we were, we were faced with a, with a challenge in Puerto Rico that if you were to cut uh, too deeply or cut uh, in, any, in any major fashion the public pensions, you would find yourself with a new social set of expenditures, which would reduce, reduce your ability to sustain debt going forward anyway. Because these people had literally, in many cases, let's just take teachers, for example, no alternative. They had no social security. Mm -hmm. So this was their singular um, uh, source of uh, income when they retire. I think the other thing that 
it needs to be taken into account is that we didn't leave Puerto Rico with the same pension system. So there are no defined benefit systems left in the Puerto Rico public pensions. All of them have been frozen. All new employees are enrolled in what we would call, you know, a defined contribution or a 401k, something like that. So the government is not incurring new expanding um, liabilities on the behalf of new public employees going forward. And I don't think there's a municipality that I'm aware of that is has that benefit that 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 that, that was created uh, financially for Puerto Rico in this process. So I think you know if you were to ask a pensioner that freeze and that fact that no one, no one is earning a defined benefit going forward is a major um, cost to these pensioners that doesn't appear in the numbers. But in fact, if you're attracting cops, just as, a, as an example, one of the reasons the oversight board had to come up with something incremental in the defined contribution side for police is because you're competing with every jurisdiction in the United States for these cops. Bilingual police, you know, are, are much in need throughout the country, and there isn't a single police force that I'm aware of that doesn't offer a defined benefit plan. So, you know, public pensioners had had problems previously, uh, or excuse me, had reductions. I think we need to take that into account. And I think that, you know, we take the second point, the, the, the average pensions were quite low mm -hmm. in, the, in the teachers, the judge, the, the teachers and the um, and the, and, the, and the general public um, pension fund. And I think third, um, not having a defined benefit plan going forward is a very meaningful thing that, that was, was given up, um, which fiscally is much better for Puerto Rico going forward, but is, makes it very different than other munis are gonna be considering. Now that's true. Um, that's a good point. And that was, uh, that, I, I agree with you, I, I think, um, for Puerto Rico, it was a much more complicated situation in terms of how do we deal with the uh, the retirement system and fixing that than in in some other places. And um, but it's um, it, it, it makes a big difference for the island's finances and the people on the island that once again there will be a pension fund. It will be growing every year. And um, I also wanted to get back into the we talked about it. Um, uh, David Skill mentioned it very briefly, the, the CVI, the Contingent Value Instrument, and how that, um, that was part of the compensation for, for bondholders. Um, and what this is, is it's, it's a very new type of instrument for the municipal bond market. And uh, basically, if, if Puerto Rico's sales, annual sales tax collections come in uh, greater than expected, better than expected, then um, then that's how bondholders receive payment that year on the CBI. Um, so David or Natalie, if you just want to talk about this instrument, like how, how did it come? To, I, I think in the past you guys have told me that it was, um, you know, the, the people at City, your financial advisor, uh, maybe brought this up and, but, you know, tell me really how it, it all came to be. I'll, I'll say a few words and then maybe um, Natalie can, can fix my mistakes and clarify and, and add things. Um, the idea of a CVI was out there almost from the beginning. So it, it was floating around the question, would there be a CVI, would there not be um, a CVI? I, I think City did come up with the ultimate idea. I may be misremembering that, but that's, that's my recollection. Um, the obvious benefit of a CVI is it's a way to, to agree to disagree. Uh, the creditors mm -hmm. thought Puerto Rico was going to go gangbusters in the next 20 or 30 years. We were more concerned about where things were headed. There was a very big difference of opinion on likely future revenues, and a CVI is a way to, to bridge, um, bridge that gap. There are real downs, are there are real risks with CVIs as well, however, if you, if you uh, um, connect a CVI to a number that's either um, undependable, it doesn't really track the economy well, or it's manipulable, um, it can be gained, a CVI can be, can be a big mess. Um, and in the past, in the sovereign space, uh, 
CDIs have often been linked to GNP and they have sometimes miss, uh, misfired. So we were very mm -hmm. concerned about that, did not agree to one until very late in the process. As you mentioned, the one we agreed to is, is connected to sales tax revenues. And in our view, it was, it's a really, really elegant CVI. It's very attractive because it's only a portion of Puerto Rico's revenues. The maximum it can, um, it can end up being is less than 8% of Puerto Rico's revenues. It's also a stream of revenues that's very difficult to gain. Uh, sales tax revenues as revenues go are pretty precisely determined. It's, hard, it's pretty hard to, to uh, play games with them. They also track the economy really well. Um, and so we ended up with the CBI that I, I think it's, um, I think it's a wonderful CBI. Maybe we'll come back in 10 years and it will misfire and we'll say, what in the world were we doing? But um, I really think it is, it's an elegant CBI that um, I think people ought to look at in other public entity bankruptcy or restructuring kinds of situations. Yeah, John, do you anticipate that this CVI structure could be used in other muni workouts potentially? Yeah, I, I I think so. I think I, I think it's a good idea, and it does make sense and align the uh, the creditors and the um, and the debtor together. Yes, absolutely. And and so far, you know, it's only been a few months, but what has been the the market's reaction to to the CBI? I think it's generally been pretty favorable. I think that, you know, there's been outflows market market wide. So it's been a it's been a challenging time for I guess all the entire market, but all the all the Puerto Rico bonds over the over the last few months. Mm -hmm. And John, did you have something to say about pensions? Was there a comment that you want to make about Oh, about I will just well just quickly because I, I totally agree with everything Natalie said, but she's right to bring out the fact that all these reforms had already been made and, and the reforms going forward and that the, the pensions were modest um, to begin with. But I, I do think your original question about is this going to happen in the rest of the market? And I think, yeah, I think that th there is a precedent that was set in, in Detroit and in some of the California bankruptcies. You know, that's never been litigated all the way up. So I, I don't know, it might not be the case, but I think when you think about it, when you're in negotiations, it's just um, um, the pensioners, I think, have a, a better moral claim and a better political claim, you know, a retired bus driver, a retired teacher or something, than, than do, uh, does a mutual fund, for example, who might be hesitant to get into a public fight uh, with pensioners. So I, I, I do think that that's, that's largely a, a precedent and it'll continue to go that way. Mm -hmm. I also think this this is a, an interesting policy issue that that will arise, you know, in other states. You know, um, in general, uh, human beings are not very good at making intertemporal uh, decisions, you know, between different time frames. And uh, this this raises a question, you know, which group is very positioned to to assess and assume this risk, bondholders or pensioners? Uh, and in general, you would say bondholders would have. A, or their financial advisors uh, would be in a better position to to assess and assume this risk than your average you know government worker. So and generally you want to allocate risk to those who, who are uh, the better uh, position to bear them over the long run. So uh, so I think this precedent uh, uh, make I mean this decision will keep keep coming up. I mean Illinois has problems and other states have problems with uh, with pensions. It's not only Puerto Rico and. And, and this is just going to keep arising. You know, uh, who, which group is is really best positioned to actually assume this risk? Mm -hmm. And um, I want uh, to get into PREPA, the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority. That's uh, that's really the main entity that's sort of next in terms of th that needs to be uh, restructured. There's about nine billion, roughly about nine billion of debt uh, that needs to be worked out, and uh, PREPA is the main supplier of electricity on the island, and um, it has its troubles. There's, I'm, I hear from many people who live there, Sergio, you can uh, uh, tell us about this, but, but that, um, that outages are, are very common. Um, the electricity is not cheap, um, and so there's, there's been a lot of frustration on the island with, with, uh, with the electricity. So, um, David, if, if you could 
you know, kind of get us up to speed on sort of what's the next step with in PREPA's bankruptcy and where is it at? Um, that's precisely the thing I can say the least about, but I can <laughs> like it because we're in mediation right now. I can um, I can uh, put the framework in, in place, though, and if, other, if others want to make comments, they can make comments. Um, so uh, PREPA was, a, was a, a disaster even before PROMESA was enacted. When people talked about uh, Puerto Rico's financial crisis back in uh, 2014, 2015, they usually had PREPA in particular in mind. Uh, PREPA had blackouts back then. Um, I remember on the eve of our first public meeting back in 2016, there was a blackout. Um, uh, so so uh, PREPA was a mess even before PROMESA. It got even worse after Hurricane um, Maria. So it is it, it is essential to Puerto Rico's future. It has been the biggest problem or one of the biggest problems in many respects. Um, the, the two things that I would mention are the two pieces of the transformation of PREPA. Um, one is the debt restructure, and I'll get to that in a second, which is what you asked about in particular. The other is um, transforming PREPA so that these problems of the past um, will be problems of the past and not problems of the, of the future. Uh, the uh, governors of Puerto Rico with the Oversight Board support have brought in a private operator to run Puerto Rico's transmission and distribution. PREPA is still publicly owned, but there's now a private operator called LUMA for the, the uh, distribution and transmission. Um, their coming in over the last year or so has been, um, it has not been a magic wand that has caused all the problems to go away, but the trajectory is good. And I think uh, they, will, they will end up being an important part of the transformation of PREPA. There is a request for proposals process that is well, well underway for, to bring in a private operator for the, the old generation assets, the legacy uh, uh, generation as well. So a big part of PREPA's future is getting this in place, transforming it to make it a reliable um, source of electricity. Um, the other part of it is the restructuring. Um, there was a restructuring uh, uh, that was partially negotiated before PROMESA. Um, it was renegotiated uh, in the uh, several years after PROMESA. We ended up with an agreement in principle, uh, which is called a, was called a um, restructuring support agreement with uh, most of the bondholders who are 90% of the debt of PREPA. Um, that was tentatively reached in 2018. It was finalized in 2019, um, but then we had the pandemic and also some resistance from the legislature to passing the legislature, legislation mm -hmm. that that agreement needed. Um, it kind of, it was in place, um, uh, one of our advisors described it as having been on life support for a while. Um, <laughs> earlier this year, the governor terminated it. We agreed with the governor's termination of the agreement because the economics no, no longer made sense after, um, after everything that had happened with, um, with the pandemic. Um, we are in negotiations with the bondholders and with the other creditors. That is in mediation. It has been in mediation for, um, for a number of weeks now. We have a deadline of August 1st to either put a plan on, on the table, um, a proposed a plan of adjustment, or put a term sheet on the table, or um, put in place or, or suggest a schedule for litigation. There are, there are several key issues that, um, that, are potential, that are the subject of litigation and that litigation at this point is, is all on hold. So where we are is we're in the middle of the, the restructuring. Uh, it's in mediation, so I can't say uh, really much of anything about the details. Do you think it's I just want to add two things, Michelle, one pre yeah. and one um, post. Pre, just so everyone understands that the FEMA monies to, to rebuild the damaged electric system uh, only started to have, at, PREPA only started to access them. Mm -hmm. 
this year. So four and a half years afterwards. So when we talk about Luma and we talk about short, you know, Luma is operating a system that was incredibly damaged and has only now, literally, I think January, was the first access to the FEMA monies to, re, to rebuild, restore the system. And so, you know, that, that is really critical. There's a substantial amount of federal funding going to rebuild the system, much of it, the great bulk of it into transmission, and it's only just begun. So contracts were only starting to be let in January, February this year. That, that's all ahead of us. And then the second part that I'll just mention in terms of the future is that just as important as that P3 that is in process for the legacy generation is uh, the government and the board working carefully together on a wide variety of RFPs for uh, renewables. And I'm, I've been gone off, off the island for a month, so I can't say exactly, but I know where we were, which is, you know, we had done a thousand megawatts already, and we were in the process of doing the next big um, piece of renewables such that you could slowly decommission the legacy assets over time and move to cleaner, cheaper, and more reliable generation on, on, on the side of renewables. So two, two more pieces of this prep a picture to take into account. That's interesting. Yeah, it's uh, go, going hand in, in, in just like how the, the economy is benefits when it's diversified for prep as well uh, to d diversify how it creates the energy is is super important as well. And, um, you know, David, what would not to be negative, but what would it if PREPA were to leave um, Title III and need to be litigated, uh, what would that look like? What what court would that be in? Um, what what would that process be like? It it would be in the Title III court. Um, it would stay in Title III court. Okay. It would stay in the Title III okay. court. Uh, so Judge Swain would would be overseeing it. As I said, there there are a number of different issues. One of the big one. Uh, big ones is whether the bondholders have a valid lien, and if they have a valid lien, a lien on what? Um, how much do they have a lien on? Our view is if they have a valid lien, the only lien they have is a lien on amounts that have, have already been uh, transferred into a trust. Um, and that's a, it's a, a very small amount. So, um, so there, there's litigation along those lines um, that, uh, and there's some other issues around that as well. The creditors committee has, has um, some litigation that it would like to pursue as well. Now, hopefully that won't be necessary, but, um, but it is out there. But doesn't, don't bondholders have a lien on PREPA's ability to generate revenues? Uh, our view is no, that they have, <laughs> they only have a lien on, um, the uh, payments made by customers once those are put into an account um, for the benefit of bondholders, and until they're put into that account, the the, the lien does not does not cover them. So, so I have a question for David. Uh, so, it, it appears to me that from your answer, um, you you seem to be ruling out the 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 you know the potential of actually dismissing the Title III case? That's not one of the options we were given. <laughs> we don't have, well, so that they, is, you know, that is, uh, they, that is another possibility. Oh, you know, it is the, the judge did say that one of the options was for the board to submit a memo as to why, to, to show costs as to right, why- true. Yeah, That's true, that's true. So, that's uh, true. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't, think anybody thinks that would be a good outcome, but it, you're right, it is, it is in the memo. Um, the, as of now, I mean, do you, do you, and do you see things leaning more towards that August 1st uh, due date being extended? Because there have been extensions in the past, or are, are things progressing that something could, could be filed? That's precisely the sort of thing that I can't answer. <laughs> I've got to try. I've got to try. <laughs> so, yeah, like the good reporter that you are, uh, yeah. as, uh, as I learned very early on in this case, be careful what you say to Michelle. <laughs> and, uh, you know, everybody's been telling me this for years. Um, you can't fix Puerto Rico's economy. You can't, the economy really can't grow unless you fix PREPA. 
because the businesses need to know what their future costs are for electricity so they can forecast that um, to attract people to live on the island um, that mm -hmm. needs to be fixed. Does anyone we, want to, to weigh in on that? We, we have been saying that since 2005, actually, yeah. you know, uh, having, uh, you know, reliable, uh, affordable energy affects all economic activity, you know, hospitals, hotels, uh, farm servers, server farms, everything. So uh, unless retail, so so unless that's that's taken care of, I mean, it's a, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for uh, future growth. The the other risk going forward, in addition to to prepa, I, and going back to something that Natalie said, uh, is in my view is the. Puerto Rico political class. Uh, I mean, they they seem to have learned nothing since uh, 2015, and and that worries me. You know, uh, things that I have seen recently, um, attempts to cover recurring uh, expenses with non-recurring revenues, raiding the state insurance fund uh, to lower electricity costs for three months. Those are the kind of things that got us into this mess into the first place, right? So um, so going forward. Uh, more than economic risk and more than uh, geopolitical risk of what's happening in the world, uh, you know, endogenous to Puerto Rico is that our political class uh, is not getting its act together. Uh, and it's demonstrating to the world that they really, really have learned nothing and forgotten nothing since 2015. Well, I mean, who knows? I mean, there could be, I don't know, there could be maybe younger people on the island who start pursuing office and and in local office and I, you never know i i think there's on the mainland sometimes i'm i'm very i feel very optimistic about some young younger people who are becoming more politically active and involved and uh, i would imagine that that's got to happen in, in puerto rico as well I, I would hope so i would hope so but just recent actions that have been taken by by the legislature and the executive to be fair uh do not inspire a lot of trust i think no it's it's true it's uh it's it's a major shift that needs to be made mm -hmm. that that we really haven't seen the full effects of yet and uh, we have roughly about five minutes left or, or just a little under that and i want to get into two things this issue of um um the idea that i mean at some point puerto rico uh will probably get credit ratings again and beyond after that maybe even possibly investment grade credit ratings and i also want to talk about the future of the board so um john i wanted to ask you you know what what do you think it's going to take for puerto rico because uh, as of now the the new geos the restructured geos uh the cofinas as well the restructured sales tax bonds they don't have credit ratings yet what is it going to take for them to get ratings and then even after that investment grade mm -hmm. yeah thanks michelle well the ratings are important um a lot of a lot of Firms have bought the Puerto Rico bonds, but once they get a rating, more people can buy the bonds. There'll be a bigger market for the bonds. A lot of funds are not allowed to buy or have limited on the amount of unrated bonds they can hold. So getting a rating is, is a big deal and, and should change the pricing of the bonds. I think a key thing would be getting audited financials. I don't work at a rating agency, so I can't say exactly what they need here, but I do believe at the Puerto Rico Investor Conference I heard um, promised later this summer that the FY19 and 20 uh, audited financial statements would be out. So if that's the case, that would be a big help. I don't know if that's enough to, to get the rating, but I think that would be a big step. Um, I think getting PREPA solved, even though it's not directly related to the GO just uh, would reduce uh, uncertainty. And so that might help make the case to the rating agencies. Um, I, I think that um, right now, I mean, I would wager, like if I just had to guess where the rating would be, I would probably say that at the major rating agencies, the GO would probably be a high B category around there. And then maybe Cofina and, and Rasa, which which never defaulted on its muni debt, maybe could be a notch higher than that. Um, and then I think possibly the rating, you know, if the performance is good, the governance is good, could rise a, maybe a notch a year after that would be a kind of aggressive. So you can, you know, would be a few years to get to investment grade. I think the rating agencies, I think they'll have the same concern that investors do is what happens when the board goes away and, and what's the willingness to pay like and it, the discipline 
of uh, the local politicians, which is what we've been talking about earlier, once the board has left. And some of the rhetoric down there has, has maybe not inspired confidence. Um, so I think the rating agencies would be thinking about that too, is, is what's this rating like when the board is not there uh, watching over the, the finances? Yeah, that's true. And um, the, there's also the question of how much, uh, how much longer the board is going to be there. Um, under PROMESA, it, there needs to be um, a, a number of years of, of consecutive balanced budgets and there needs to be market access. And, um, but John, do you have sort of a, an estimate of how long you think the board will remain, the oversight I mean, board? I think that the way that Congress wrote PROMESA is pretty frustrating. When you read it, it's adequate access to short-term and long-term credit markets at reasonable interest rates. And so what does adequate mean? What is reasonable interest rates? Um, seems like the rates the bonds trade now is pretty reasonable. Um, I would think getting a rating would, would be good to proving that adequate market access and then maybe selling a small bond issue with that rating. That could help in the, the four years of balanced budgeting. I'm a little unclear. Do you have to have modified accrual balanced budgets? Do you need to have audits to prove mm -hmm. that? I, I have a lot of questions about how that works and would be interested to hear David or Natalie weigh in too. I'll Definitely. give my unofficial perspective and then David can speak officially. I have a little <laughs> more freedom than David does about it. So the law is really written such that the board gets to make the determination. There are some cardinal aspects of the determination written into the law, but there is enormous flexibility on the part of the board uh, beyond what's in the law. So it, the board has to recognize four consecutive years <clears throat> of balanced budgets on a modified accrual accounting basis for mm -hmm. all covered instrumentalities, all covered mm -hmm. instrumentalities. Now, can the board say it, can only, it will only look at this covered instrumentality or this one or that one or they all of them that's up to a, a board to make a determination at least while i was there my view was this let's try and get four balance <laughs> let's let's try and get one two three and then four before we worry about whether or not it's only the commonwealth or the commonwealth and prepa or the commonwealth prepa prasa and all the other covered instrumentalities remember that all the municipalities are also covered instrumentalities and i you know and it's up to the board to make the determination when, when it's time. And the board shouldn't, in my view, have to make that determination too early because we're not even there yet with the most basic entity, which is the Commonwealth. And in my view, yes, you would need an audited financial statement in order to use it as a comparison to the self-reported results to be able to say, yes, I, the board, designate this as a year of balanced budget based on an audit. Now, the audit won't be necessarily based on modified accrual accounting, so you're going to have to do a mapping between the self-reported and the audit, and all of that is a process. But to get there, and this is why the focus has been on the audits, which you mentioned, John, you got to get caught up on the audits. So mm -hmm. if my understanding is we should be caught, or Puerto Rico should be caught up, I'm still saying we, there you go. Puerto mm -hmm. Rico should be caught up um, sometime you know, next year. Uh, by the end of next year, it, it theoretically could have the fiscal year, um, you know, in, in place uh, audited, then you could look back to 21 and say 21 was or was not the first balanced year for the Commonwealth. Uh, and that's leaving aside all of the judgment involved in the second piece that you mentioned, which is adequate market access at reasonable rates. That's just the first piece, right? Let's just try and get the first piece was my view. Um, and we're not, we're not even at one year technically because we don't yet have an audited year for the balanced year. And a balanced year would require post debt restructuring so that your debt service was actually in there when you made the determination. Mm -hmm. So you know that, that's where I think, I think the board has, the law gives the board enormous space to make the determination above and beyond what's in, you know, written in the text of the law. Mm -hmm. David, was there anything you wanted to add about uh about the board and, and how much longer the, the board would be um, working on Puerto Rico's finances? No, I was really glad that Natalie did all the talking. <laughs> uh, all I'll say is um, just to kind of underscore, I, I share Natalie's view that we need audited financial 
uh, mm -hmm. audited financials. And so we will not officially have a, the first balanced budget until we have those audited financials. I believe we're through 2019 um, at this um, at this point. Um, but and the the fiscal year 22, the one we just finished, could be the first balanced budget. Um, it has the potential to be, but we won't know until we have audited financials. That, that so. was fiscal 22? Fiscal 22. Yeah, the current um, year. Yeah, yeah, the key is. was restructuring the debt and, and Puerto Rico making payments on its debt obligations. Yeah. Great. This gets back to something Sergio mentioned earlier that everyone needs to take into account. I mean, there is a constitutional requirement for a balanced budget. And so we get to the question, you know, like, why is that not happening? Well, because it appears that it's been kind of understood to mean when you adopt it, are the numbers balanced, my projection of revenue with it versus do I maintain an actual balanced budget during the course of the year? So you have a legislature that typically, you know, legislates and expenditures that are not budgeted during the year. They have to stop doing that as a practice, right? Mm -hmm. If you haven't budgeted an expenditure and you're adding it, you know, that's clearly going to put you out of balance during the course of the year. And that happens, you know, at least while I was there the last five years, constantly. So I, I think this, this concept of what is a balanced budget mean needs to really be refined in the thinking of the legislators and the elected officials. And actually, the, the language in the Constitution says that whenever, um, you know, expenses exceed available resources as opposed to revenues, which is a big problem, <laughs> uh, then Puerto Rico should, uh, must increase taxes. The thing is that the phrase available resources has been interpreted by different lawyers and even by the Puerto Rico uh, Secretary of Justice, Attorney General, to increase include the issuance of debt. So that's how we got into this mess into the, into the first place, right? Because the concept of available resources is much broader than available revenues. And, and they included the issuance of new debt for deficit financing in order to, to bridge the gap. So that's one of the things that we definitely need to fix in the constitution. John, was there one thing that you were gonna, uh, you were gonna say? I, I was just really quickly gonna say Congress could change this at, at any time. It's true. Yeah, there, there is a bill currently in the U.S. Congress that would uh, allow the board to wrap up sooner than what PROMESA um, spells out. But um, from what we've been hearing so far is that there there doesn't seem to be a lot of movement of that bill. So but we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I, I want to thank everyone for participating today. And I I really enjoyed this. And it's great seeing you guys all together and, and discussing Puerto Rico and um, Thank you again so much for a wonderful panel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.